continuing with finite abelian groups. We explore consequences of orthogonality of characters, and we formalize things using Fourier transforms. Now, G is a finite abelian group. We have G star, the character group of G. So recall, the characters are the irreducible representations of G. Because G is finite abelian, they're all one-dimensional. We're studying L2 of G, the vector space of complex valued functions on G. We turn this into an inner product space using the following definition. Now, this inner product is invariant under the left and right actions of G on functions, so we get unitary representations on L2 of G. Our main result from last time, the set of characters form an orthonormal basis for L2 of G. Okay, so each one-dimensional representation can be thought of as a function on the group. Now, what this says, if we take any two characters, put them into our inner product, if they're equal, we get one, so the characters are unit vectors. If we put in distinct characters, we get zero, so the characters are orthogonal. Now, that means the characters form a linearly independent set. To see spanning, we just note that the number of elements in G is the same as the number of elements in G star. So here I have the number of characters. Here I have the dimension of L2 of G, so spanning. Now, consequences that fall out of this. First, we can decompose L2 of G in terms of its irreducible representations. And that happens as follows. So we note for each subspace, subrepresentation, okay, span of each character, Lx by the conjugate of the character, Rx by the character itself. So that's full reducibility for L2 of G. Then, using the orthonormal basis, Okay, whenever we have an orthonormal basis, we can invoke Fourier's trick and Parseval's identity. So if I'm given any function on the group and I want to write it in terms of the characters, the recipe we use, okay, the coefficients are given by just taking the inner product of our function with the given character for the coefficient. Then we have Parseval's identity, which says if we take the length squared of our function, that's just going to be given by taking the sum of the squares of the moduli of our coefficients. For an example, let g be equal to z mod 2. So we have 0 and 1 under addition. 1 plus 1 is 0. We set up the character table. So we have two characters, trivial and sign. We could check that we have an orthonormal basis. So if I take the length square of the trivial character, okay, we'll have a half, 1 over the order of the group. Then 1 squared plus 1 squared gives us 1. So we have a unit vector. We check trivial against sine. Okay, we have a half, and then one minus one gives us zero, so these are orthogonal. To check Fourier's trick and Parseval's identity, let's use the function f given by f of zero is four, f of one is two. We apply Fourier's trick. So if we take the inner product of f with the trivial character, okay, we're gonna have a half. Four plus two gives us three, and if we take the inner product of f with the sine character, we're going to have 4 minus 2 gives us 2 divided by 2 gives a 1. So these are the coefficients of f. We expand in terms of the character basis. So I have f equal to 3 chi triv plus chi sine. And if we expand out, we'll see that we get the 4, 2 back. Now for Parseval's identity, can we check that the length squared of our function is equal to the sum of the squares of the moduli of the coefficients. So checking the length square of the function, I have a half, four squared plus two squared gives 10. Sum of the squares of the coefficients, we get three squared plus one squared also gives 10, so that checks out. Now, another big consequence. If we have pi v, any representation of our group, full reducibility says we could decompose v as a direct sum of irreducible representations. Now, because we're working with a finite abelian group, we've seen that this just means I could find some base of v such that all of our pi g are put in a diagonal form at the same time. Then the diagonal entries, as we let g vary, are just gonna be the characters that show up in this representation. So, big question we have is, given pi v, how do we know what representations are in there? How do we figure out 
where these irreducible subspaces are. So we can answer the first question here. We'll answer the second one in the next part. So if we put this into diagonal form, all I need to know is what's happening on the diagonal. So we can pick off all these entries by using trace. Okay, so that's what we're gonna call the character of pi, not to be confused with the one-dimensional characters. So that's just given by taking the trace of each pi of g, and this gives me a function on the group. Now, by our picture here, all this is doing is taking the sum of all the characters. So when the characters are the same, we're just gonna collect them together, and that'll give us the number of times that it appears out in front of the character in the function. So that's what we're calling the multiplicity. Now, formula for this, okay, we just use the fact that we have an orthonormal basis. If I wanna pick off this coefficient here, we just take the inner product of our function with the character that we're interested in. So this is an easy way to figure out multiplicities in a given representation. For an example, again, we'll use g equal to z mod two. For our vector space, I'm gonna take the basis E0 through E3. Okay, we take all linear combinations. For the representation, we're gonna let pi of zero be the identity. Pi of one, it's just gonna take the index, add two modulo four. So E0 goes to E2, E1 goes to E3, E2 goes to E0, E3 goes to E1. Now, if I wanna find out what irreducible representations are in here, I need to figure out the character of this representation. So if we take the trace of pi zero, okay, our representation's four dimensional. So trace of the identity is gonna be equal to four. For pi of one, okay, I'll put this in terms of okay, our basis. So we'll get this four by four matrix. If we take the trace, we get zero. Now note, because trace is invariant under change of basis, I don't need to have it in diagonal form as on the previous board. We'll get the same answer. We set up our character table, and then we apply our formula. So I want to take the inner product of chi sub pi with each character. When we do that, we're going to get two for each multiplicity. Because all the representations are one dimensional, we'll have that two plus two is four, checking the dimensions. Now, we'll see in the next part how we actually find the subspaces that go with each of these representations. Shifting gears, we want to consider the formalism of Fourier transforms. Okay, so here we're talking about discrete Fourier transforms. Now, for the overriding philosophy, I just want to consider V to be any finite dimensional inner product space. So no group actions. Because we have an inner product space, we could choose an orthonormal basis B. Okay, we'll give that by the vectors V sub I. And then we have Fourier's trick and Parseval's identity. Okay, so Fourier's trick just says, well, I have an orthonormal basis, so we can expand any vector V in terms of that basis, and then we have a formula that gives us the coefficient for each basis vector. Parseval's identity says, once you have these coefficients, we have a rule for the length squared of any vector. Now, what we wanna do is, for a Fourier transform, I wanna take these coefficients and put them together in terms of a function. So the idea is we're gonna have this map from our vector space V to the space of functions on our basis. Here we consider our basis as a set of points, not a set of vectors. The map that I use, okay, so each vector here is gonna give us a function. This function, if I put any basis vector in here, it's just gonna peel off the coefficient that goes with that basis vector. What properties does F have? First, F is linear. So F factors through linear combinations. This means if we want to compute with F, it's enough just to do so on a basis for V. Then we have F is unitary. So this is with respect to the inner product on L2 of B, given as follows. Okay, note there's no normalization out in front. What this says is that F preserves the inner product. Now this is just a restatement of Parseval's identity. And we also have, because F is unitary, it's an isomorphism. If we want an orthonormal basis for L2 of B, 
we can use f of vi, where the vi are from the original basis. So we note, we take f of vi applied to vj, we get one if j is equal to i, and zero otherwise. So what happens when I apply f to one of our original basis vectors, out comes a delta function. Without the normalization, the delta functions will form an orthonormal basis. Finally, we have the inverse Fourier transform. What happens here? If I want to start on L2 of B and go back to V in a way that undoes everything that F does, all we do, I'm just going to let, okay, we're going to take each F of VI multiplied by VI and then sum over our basis. So what we're doing here, we're taking, okay, the coefficients, okay, that's the image of Fourier transform, and then we're just going to reconstruct the original vector. So that just puts everything back together from the coefficients. Now to check that, okay, if I apply F inverse to F of V, okay, well, what do we do? We just write out the definition. This term here is just going to be the inner product of V with VI, and then what's coming out is just the expression for V in terms of the orthonormal basis. Now, suppose G is a finite abelian group. We'll let V be equal to L2 of G, okay, the vector space of complex valued functions on G. We're assuming a normalization in the inner product, so we're keeping the one over order of G. For our orthonormal basis, okay, we're going to use a set of characters. So here, note, for L2 of B, there's no normalization. If I was using this as L2 of G star, we would keep the one over order of G star out in front, but not here. We have Fourier transform on a function f. So there we would expand f in terms of the orthonormal basic characters, pick off the coefficients. For the inverse Fourier transform, we take a function L2 of b, use its values to set up a function in terms of the character basis. So as follows. Now, if we compose these, we should get the identity, so this should cancel out. So let's see what happens with that. Take f of g equal to, so we have inverse Fourier transform, Fourier transform of f, evaluated at g. We expand out the definitions. Then we note we can combine the characters at the end. So that's going to give us an equation or a formula for the convolution of f with the character chi convolution is going to be the theme of our next part. So we won't say much more about this here other than convolution is what's going to let us set up projections from L2 of G to the character spaces and projections from a given representation to its irreducible types. Now, leaving convolution for next time, still some more things we can do. We have another orthonormal basis for L2 of G which is a bit more natural than the characters. So what I can do is I can take a set of delta functions on G, and then we just rescale by the square root of the order of G to make them unit vectors. Now recall, if I have the delta function of G evaluated at X, it's going to be equal to 1 if X and G are equal, and 0 otherwise. So if you're thinking of a function, it's going to be 0 everywhere except at this one point G. Then see that we have a basis, just note, if I take any function f, that's going to be the same as taking the sum, where we take each delta function, multiply by the value of f at g. So, where the delta functions are spanning. See linearly independent? Well, we note if we put these in the inner product, we're going to have orthogonality. So what happens here, okay, we work this out, we'll get a 1 over order of the group if g is equal to g prime and 0 otherwise. So if we scale, we get an orthonormal basis. Finally, okay, and I'll note, if we decompose L2 of g with respect to the group action, okay, the irreducible types are just going to be the character spaces. If we let the group act on the delta functions, then we see all we're doing here is just multiplying the g's that we're indexing by. So we have the left action and the right action. So the delta functions look nice in terms of the group multiplication, but not necessarily in terms of the representation theory. To interpret delta functions using representations, we consider G star, the character group of G, instead of G itself. So exercise, 
fix a G in the group, consider E sub G, evaluation of G, carries the character group G star to the complex numbers. So E sub G on chi is just defined as chi evaluated at G. First, show that E sub G is a character of G star. So E sub G is an element of the dual of the dual group of G, so G double dual or G double star. Then we'll show the assignment from G to E sub G, so isomorphism between G and G double star. Finally, for representations, we'll define an action of G star on L2 of G by just multiplication by characters. So pi of chi on F is just chi times F. We'll show that pi is a unitary representation of G star on L2 of G. And we show that the irreducible types are given by the delta functions. So specifically, the span of delta G has type E sub G for G star. Now, as a final note, we mentioned a brief application, so trig interpolation polynomials. Recall from before, if I had a nice enough function on the circle, we could approximate it using Fourier series. So we have a similar idea here, it's just a different approach. Now, what happens okay, if I let g be equal to z mod n, I can identify this group as a subgroup of the circle group. So the idea is I'll let omega be equal to e to the 2 pi over n, and then we just start taking powers of this. So what will happen, we'll get n points on the circle when we return to 1. Now, the idea is, okay, we have z mod n, we have characters of z mod n, we'll have finitely many values of f taken on these points in the circle. So we could use that with Fourier's trick to get coefficients for a function on the circle group. Okay, and then here we take the characters on z mod n, extend them to functions on the circle. Now, the idea here, if we let n get large, then the space between these points is gonna get smaller and smaller. So when n is very large, we're essentially looking at functions on the circle. And then this is something we can work with in the real world.